I was at a family gathering, Christmas Eve, circa 2013, getting to the part of the night where everyone slowly drifts into different groups to conversate. I, being a bored eight-year-old stuck at a party with adults, walked off into my auntie's room, where I found her sitting by herself, playing what I assume was Professor Layton in the Curious Village. This was so long ago that I cannot remember exactly. After watching her play for a while, she offered me a turn. This wasn't unusual, as I recall most of the time spent at my grandparents' house was devoted to being Elder Scrolls V with her. Now I sucked at the puzzle game presented before me, so she offered to switch games, and this moment was my introduction to the Pokemon series. Now I've seen bits of the anime on CITV Saturday morning cartoons, although I much prefer Digimon Data Squad, but I never actually sat down and played a Pokemon game, and holy shit, I was hooked. I have such a vivid memory of sinking into one of her beanbags, surrounded by my auntie's posters of Pink Floyd and Trogdor the Burninator, and picking my first Pokemon, Chimchar, which I appropriately named Fire Monkey. I followed through the tedious tutorial section and began my journey throughout the Sinnoh region. I can safely assume you haven't had this exact experience, but I would bet on you having similar responses to your first time playing Pokemon. Sort of a snapshot memory of where you were, what game it was, who your first starter was. No, seriously, ask anyone that likes Pokemon and I can assure you they'll have this knowledge on hand. Eventually, the time for my parents to drive home came, and I had to face the reality of parting ways with my newfound obsession. Until my auntie, very generously, let me take the DS home with me, alongside the cartridge for Pokemon Diamond. At this time, my mum had regulated a heavy no-DS ban in my household, much to the dismay of me and my sister. I was relegated to grinding Smash Bros Brawl on the Wii, surprisingly a gift from another cousin. Pro tip, have cousins that are at least 10 years older than you, because you might get free shit from time to time. But not even my mother's rule could overpower the sheer might of an autistic 8 year old with a Pokemon fixation. Just to push how big of a revolution this was for me, I still have the exact DS Lite and the Pokemon game cartridge I was given, albeit a little worse for wear than it used to be. Throughout the following months, I played non-stop, beating every gym, building my team, and catching them all, as the kids say. From what I can remember, my team comprised of Infernape, Staraptor, Roserade, Floatzel, Luxray, and Onyx. And we slaughtered the Sinnoh region. Although I never actually finished the game, clearly nothing's changed about my lack of dedication to projects I start. Also, side note, I have a really vivid memory of playing Dawn, or the girl option, and defending it with my life against my friends. I was using the excuse that I just preferred her design. Something really should have clicked in my head at that point. Eventually, I got bored of replaying the same game every single time, and the introduction of more consoles to my house didn't help. Time had passed, and I'd changed. It was inevitable. My auntie's DS, which used to bring me so much joy, had been left to collect dust, alongside the boxes of old Wii games. The days of battling Barry and Team Galactic were replaced with working my Saturday job, revising for my GCSEs and generally boring activities. Being stuck inside one winter, I searched the house for a way to pass time, which is when I stumbled across it. My old DS lay down where I placed it so many years ago. The stickers of Ho-Oh and Lugia slightly peeled, dust filling the power slide and the flickering blue light just fighting to stay on. Picking it up to examine the relic and maybe reminisce on old memories, I noticed there was something wedged in the cartridge slot. Only after I popped it out did I realize what I stumbled on. The original Pokemon Diamond copy that I had cherished so much. Booting up was the biggest kick in the stomach of nostalgia that I've had in a while, but this was only the beginning. My return to Sinnoh was very reminiscent of younger Unijoy. Picking up Chimchar once again, I ventured out, falling back into my naive obsession. In all honesty, I think I was more consumed as a 14 year old than ever before. Though I'd changed, playing Pokemon Diamond sent me back into that childlike innocence, separating me from my issues. If I recall correctly, my final team consisted of Infernape, 
Drifblim, Machoke, Gyarados, Snorlax, and Garchomp. Small flex, but yeah, I got Munchlax. If anyone knows about how you get Munchlax in Pokemon Diamond, you will know how big of a flex this is. I had a whole system set up where I'd put honey on the tree on the bus before school. Then once my school had finished and I was back on the bus, I'd check it again and I just fucking rinsed and repeated that for so long. At some point, I came to the realization that this game was an escape. I didn't want to grow up, and I know that's cliche and a little bit cringe, but standing at the crossroads of maturity and staring deep into that unforgiving void of the future is so terrifying. So in an attempt to avoid the progression of time, I just sunk my life into escapism. Enter French playwright and existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre. Sartre denotes this negative escapism as bad faith a refusal to face facts or choices. Sartre argues that we possess two modes of consciousness, one to consider our surroundings, called the pre-reflective, and another to reflect on our experiences, called the reflective. An example that Wikipedia and myself will give is an image of running down a bus. When you're chasing the bus, use your pre-reflective consciousness, focused on the departing bus. Then, once you realize you can't catch the bus, your reflective conscious comes into play, focused on your failed chase and need to reapply deodorant for the day. You don't become conscious of yourself running after the bus until you cease to run after it, because until then, your consciousness is focused on the bus and not one chasing it. For Sartre, being conscious means we're innately aware of the separation of the world around us. Like as a kid when you stop being afraid that people could read your inner monologue, that's being conscious of the separation. And the issue that I and many others face is letting the pre-reflective consciousness overpower the reflective consciousness. When humans face pressure from societal forces, such as employment, parents, and education, they may adopt a set of false values, where they submit their human freedom to adopt society's values, living in hegemony with those around and letting their pre-reflective consciousness just take over. Sartre argues that one must recognize that we cannot escape responsibilities. Adopting false values will not relinquish our stress, only delay it. We must recognize that our life rests within our own choices. Sure, you can hunt for that shiny Gyarados, but like it or not, your problems will still exist once you put the DS down. By recognizing your existence, you can utilize your innate human freedoms to take responsibility at life. This argument is at the crux of most existentialist writers. Removing your distractions and escapism to take control, this is how you can live fully. Much like the wise philosopher Mewtwo said in the 1998 Pokemon movie, humans may have created me, but they will never enslave me. This cannot be my destiny. Thank you for watching.